Hello, and welcome to the December of 2021 Kubernetes release note video. Uh, this is where I make release notes as simple as one, two, three. Just like this December's Kubernetes release 123. If you heard the rumors that Merrick doesn't count, that rumor is false. That is, in fact, not my middle name, and I have proof to show. Now, I warn you, I'm working on making these videos as fun and informative as possible, but I warn you to go ahead and look at the Kubernetes release notes yourself, as maybe there's something that's important to you and your infrastructure that I didn't think of as important for me. But if you do find something that you think is important that I missed, go ahead and leave a comment so that the rest of the community can see it. Also, join the Discord if you'd like to uh, discuss these at more detail and at length. For right now, though, I'm trying to bring you the ones that I think will have the biggest impact for you and the community as a whole. I personally think that this was a relatively quiet release when it comes to new features, but there are a lot of really exciting, uh, really exciting improvements on the features already released, even though there's not many of these brand new features per se. So do stick around because there's going to be quite a few things that I think you uh, you guys will all be very excited about and should be keeping your eyes on. But before we dig into the nitty gritty, let's start with a few few stats on this release. If you like random stats, let me know and I'll make sure to include them on each release note video that I make. First, there are 43 things marked as enhancements uh, for this release. That's down 13 from the 122 release and five from the 121 release. Of those 43 things, only 19 things are new and the rest are enhancements and graduating to higher levels of stability. That being said, the enhancement tracking doc noted that there was 47 enhancements, while Sysdig and a few other blogs counted 45. And when I counted, there were only 43. We are, we're probably all wrong. I should have just gone with 42. It's always the answer. Um, so really, I'm not sure anyone knows actually how many enhancements made into this last release. I mean, I literally counted them three different times just to make sure. So I'm pretty sure I'm right. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. Anyways, let's move on to a little more data mining. There have been a total of 2,745 commits to the Kubernetes repo since the last release in 122. They averaged over 100 unique contributors per month and pushed around 600 commits per month. That is quite a few commits to a single repository. And that's not counting any of the other repositories in the Kubernetes SIG. I'm going to have to do even more data mining to bring you guys more stats on that. So let's Let's start with my number one pick for the biggest impact. And this might be just me because I work quite a bit with operators, but Kubernetes operators are going to get just a little easier going forward. Previously, there were only two ways to understand if the custom resource that was applied to the cluster was of any value. The first was just schema type validation checks. Did you pass an integer where we expected an integer? But then, just simple verification beyond this required you to implement an entire webhook. And for many of you, you were just wanting to ensure a simple solution. Like if the initial replicas was set equal to three, then you cannot set max replicas equal to two. But to do just this simple validation requires setting up and maintaining a full-fledged webhook. Well, not anymore. With the implementation of KEP 2876, you can now use the common expression language or CLI. It's a lightweight and it runs on the API server and lets you do some lightweight verification without the hassle of setting up a webhook. This lets the API server quickly and easily verify your custom resource definition with a little bit extra data and a little bit extra fields to be able to check with. And it allows you to do this simple verification. Though the use of CLI doesn't have to stop here, it could be extended to other emission control as well as defaulting of values. Really, it is almost like being bringing something like Python or some other scripting language, though just to warn you, CLI is not 
Turing complete. So it is not like another scripting language at all. Um, it is very simple. But don't worry. I will do one of my monthly streams on this. It's one of the reasons I made the streams to ensure I was given the time to test out and try some of these new things as I don't always have a time to make a full video on them. Anyhow, this is just in alpha, uh, so it's going to be a few releases, probably at least a year before it's GA. All right, next topic. Let's go over some notable mentions. These are things that I thought were important to bring up, but they might lack substance or just be very self-explanatory, so I will not give them each their own section, and I'm gonna be going over them rapid fire mentioning them, though there will be links to all of this in the description if you wanna read more. Open API v3 continues to get better support in Kubernetes. For all of you that don't know, this was originally called Swagger in versions one and two. GRPC probe to pods was added to enable streamlined GRPC environments, and a few things uh, look to be removed in the upcoming 125 release, so you can check those out in the deprecation page if you will need time to prepare. That's linked below. Clog, or K-Log, I like to call it Clog, is getting cleaned up. Kubernetes history with logging and refusing to use some of the better logging libraries out there in Go requires them to reinvent the wheel again and again. The component config work continues. The scheduler's up to 1 v1 beta 3, and it deprecates v1 beta 1. This will, by rule of law, need to go GA next release or get ripped out. Dual stack goes stable. This is uh, IPv6 and IPv4 dual stacks. Add of server side unknown field validation so that the server can validate unknown fields like the client has been doing with the dash dash validate equals true on the kubectl command. All right, with that out of the way, let's get on to storage. There are quite a bit of storage releases this release. Let's start with uh, how going forward we'll be able to supply a pods FS group from the CSI driver on mount. This removes it from the kubelet to give more flexibility. This will make it easier to support other platforms like Ceph and AWS EBS, as now the Ceph driver can, be, can provide the information itself. Now on this note with Ceph, the Ceph RBD entry provisioner is migrating to a CSI driver instead of the entry provider. So go check out the links to its migration. While we're on storage, let's talk about stateful sets. Soon you will be able to auto remove uh, PVCs created by stateful sets. Currently, the PVC created automatically by the stateful sets are not deleted when the stateful set is deleted, as this can be seen in the discussion in the issue 55045. There are several use cases where PVCs, which are automatically created, are deleted as well. In many stateful sets use cases, persistent volume claims, or PVCs, have a different life cycle than the pods in the stateful sets and should not be deleted at the same time. Because of all this, PVCs, or persistent volume claims, deletion will be an opt-in. To be clear, it's on deletion removal of the stateful sets. It's not on reboot or failure. If we were going to summarize all of this in short, it provides a feature to auto-delete the PVCs created by stateful sets, ensure that the pod restarts due to non-scale down events such as rolling update or node drain does not delete. There are some non-goals, and this provo proposal does not plan to address how the underlying PVs are treated on PVC deletion. That functionality will and has always been governed by the reclaim, reclaim policy of the storage class. A small improvement around the storage ensures that a volume is deleted from the storage backend when the user tries to delete the PV object manually and the PV reclaim policy is delete. And this kind of leads right into the next topic as we should always honor persistent volume reclaim policies. This actually kind of seemed to be more of a bug fix, but to my understanding, how they had to go about fixing it requires a little finesse to keep backwards compatibility. You 
can look forward to a deprecation in the future regarding the old broken way, but for right now, the old way should still work. Let's talk about a little networking. In ne networking, there was really just stability brought to some of the cool things introduced in previous installments of Kubernetes. Mostly dual stack, IPv4 and IPv6 support graduating to stable, namespace scoped ingress class parameters graduates to stable, and topology aware hints graduates to beta. If you don't know why those are a big deal or cool, go check out my release notes on 119 and 121 as we cover those in a little bit of detail. Now everything, everybody's favorite thing is next, security. As we have talked about the fall of the pod security policy or PSP for short, the pod security admission controller is now graduated to beta and is enabled by default to the deprecated PSP. If this is interesting, leave a comment. I might, I just might, if I get enough time, make a video on it. But if I don't get to that, I will at least do one of my live stream challenges on it as well. We'll do something fun with the new admission controller and see what we can do with it. Let's move on to kubectl. Now, really, the only notable thing that I saw in kubectl was the new subcommand events. Have you ever wanted to run kubectl get events dash dash watch and have it sorted? Ever wish there was more and better features? Well, thanks to new, the new kubectl events command, not only is it above, about fixing the above bugs, but you can expect more and better features coming to the events command. This was mostly due to the fact that the events command was underneath the git and to update it re required updating the git command, which so many things rely on. So breaking out into its own command is going to make these things a lot better in the future and allow them to move forward much quicker. So let's talk about some nerdy system stuff. This will cover the kubelet, the container runtime interface or CRI, and general worker node stuffs. First up, we have support for both the CRI v1 and v1 alpha 1 at the same time. Why is this a big deal? Well, it's particularly important if you happen to have something that implements the API. So containerd and projects like Kata containers should be very interested in this. Supporting both means you just have a little bit more time to support v1. Though v1 alpha 2 has already been deprecated, so I would not count on it a whole lot longer and work to start supporting uh, the v1 one of the CRI. On these uh, notes, graceful nodes shutdown, uh, it's something we've talked about previously, got some pretty major updates. The big change here is that pod priority can be taken into consideration when specifying the total time for shutdown. The original KEP 2000 made it possible to detect node shutdown and not do it in a horrible, terrible way. Now it's getting made really useful. In KEP 2712, it makes the kubelet use shutdown configuration based on the priority of the pod values for graceful shutdown, enabling a much more refined experience around pod shutdown. Coming up next, we have support for pod and container stats from CRI feature gate, which was added. This allows the user to specify their pod stats must come from the CRI and not C Advisor. This is another step in completely removing C Advisor. This led into how previous releases we talked about the efforts to remove the C Advisor and the work being done there. This all started with the KEP 2364. This enhancement is graduating to alpha and wraps up all the work to obtain all the stats from the running pods from the CRI, aka the container runtime interface. This works to remove the dependencies for some stats the C advisor had previously provided. That being said, this is huge for non Linux system, but has further implications beyond this. You know the drill. Watch my 122 release notes if you want more information on why it's such a big deal to get rid of the C advisor. Let's talk about jobs. No, no Steve's, just jobs. Some new and exciting things are coming and a lot of big milestones are being hit for jobs. 
Now, this very first one for the jobs does not really come with a direct cap, but I have linked discussions that will that uh, talk about this as well as the caps surrounding it. But this is about relaxing update validation on jobs that have never been unsuspended to allow mutating nodes scheduling uh, directives, namely the pods, templates, node affinity, node selector, tolerations, annotations, and labels of the jobs pod template. I don't know why that was so hard to say, but it took me quite a few times. This enables a higher level queue controller to inject such directives before unsuspending a job to influence its placement, giving you just so much more control over when and how jobs run, even on what type of nodes they can run on. This is going to give you a lot more control. Along those lines, KEP 2552, the time to live after finish is graduating to stable, letting finished jobs clean up automatically, letting you configure the TTL seconds after finish field to have the controller clean them up, re reducing loads on your server. The KEP 2307, enabling jobs tracking without lingering pods, has graduated to beta, meaning you can probably start using it without fear that it's going to do something wonky. And to wrap up the job section, let's talk about KEP 2879, track ready pods in job status. Adding the job.status.ready field, this lets you count the number of job pods that have the condition of ready. This field really just helps you understand the current state of your job as it could be quite a bit of work listening to updates to try and get an accurate understanding of your job status uh, before this implementation was put into place. Have you ever thought, man, I thought automatically horizontal scaling on Kubernetes was meant to just be easy. That's why you use Kubernetes, right? Or why is the last feature of the 23rd release of Kubernetes is horizontal pod autoscaler API graduates to stable? Well, yes. It's been six years since the V2 of horizontal pod autoscaler was released. And yes, it turns out this is a hard problem to solve but it's finally graduated to stable. It's finally been solved, so we can expect V3 in about six years. So it's easy, right? Well, that is it for me today. I hope you like these release notes. Remember, if you found something you think is important or want to clarify something I said, leave a comment and let people know. As usual, if you liked this video, please go ahead and support my work by liking this video and subscribing. If you did not like this video, go ahead and subscribe anyhow. Stick around and see if these videos get any better for science. To allow mutating node scheduling declare, directives, directives.